So today's lecture, um, the title is The Evolving Landscape of Childhood Cancer Predisposition. And um, we're lucky to be joined by Dr. Christopher Porter. Dr. Porter earned his MD from Medical College of Georgia School of Medicine in Augusta, Georgia, and then completed his residency in pediatrics at Vanderbilt in Nashville. Uh, Dr. Porter is currently the director of cancer predisposition program at the AFLAC Center, uh, AFLAC Cancer and Blood Disorder Center in at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, and he's a professor of pediatrics at Emory. Um, in addition, he's also the co-chair of the Consortium for Childhood Cancer Predisposition and the co-chair of the Cancer Predisposition Working Group for COG. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Porter. We appreciate you coming today and look forward to hearing your lecture. Thank you, Jay. Um, let me share my screen. Does that look right? Yes, it does. Okay, great. Um, and um, so, so thanks for the introduction, and 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 I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, I really appreciate um, Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation for putting this seminar series together and for all of their support in childhood cancer research over the years. And, and if anybody is looking for uh, a team to join for the million mile, you could join ours um, at AFLAC. If you don't want to join Jay's, um, uh, that's always a fun event for me um, because cycling is, is one of my, one of the few things that I do outside of, of work. Um, so it, it really is an honor to be included in this seminar series, particularly in light of the accomplished speakers um, that have preceded me um, in this role. So I was asked today to speak about childhood cancer predisposition. Um, so my goals are to remind you and, and update you all about the importance of recognizing these syndromes, how it can impact care before and after a cancer diagnosis, point out a few tools that are quite useful for providers and families, and talk about some challenges and, and future efforts in, in the field. Of course, all of you are probably well aware of the seminal reports that documented the presence of underlying cancer predispositions in about 10% of children with cancer. Uh, these were published in a flurry about seven years ago. Since then, there have been several reports with similar prevalence. These reports vary in size, targeted population, genes analyzed, and definition of predispositions. So, for example, this group from Australia used a population with clinical features that are suggestive of predisposition and found variants um, in a prevalence of about 25%. Whereas in our study um, here at Affleck Cancer and Blood Disorders Center in Atlanta, the prevalence was 7%. Lower because our study population included large numbers of kids with T-cell leukemia, in which germline predispositions appear to be quite low and because we used a fairly stringent variant curation strategy, including only those that had been defined as pathogenic or likely pathogenic um, in ClinVar. Together though, regardless of study design, um, these data clearly demonstrate that a significant percentage of children with cancer have a variant in a so-called cancer predisposition gene that may impact their management prognosis and risk of subsequent cancer. And it may have implications for their family members. However, universal comprehensive germline testing is, is not yet standard of care for all children with cancer and remains primarily a research endeavor. Um, thus, it, it falls on the, the treating physician to recognize, the, recognize those in whom it may be more likely. Unfortunately, family history has been demonstrated to be fairly unreliable when used in, in isolation, but is important information that should be collected as a sibling or parent with cancer under the age of 50 is sufficient to pr prompt a referral for genetic counseling. But there are many cancer diagnoses that, that should prompt consideration of an underlying predisposition. And many of these are, are fairly rare tumors with clear associations with specific genes, in, including adrenocortical carcinoma and choriplexis carcinoma with TP53 or leaf Ramini syndrome, pleuropulmonary blastoma, pineoblastoma, and ovarian Sertoli Leydig cell tumors and Dicer-1 syndrome. And of course, retinoblastoma with, with RB1. For other tumors, uh, the underlying predispositions may be attributable to several genes. And this was a large study of, of patients with osteosarcoma that demonstrated that 18% of individuals with osteosarcoma um, harbor a variant in one of the autosomal dominant cancer susceptibility genes, including in many that, that were not previously linked with osteosarcoma. The highest frequency 
was in children under the age of 10 years old. Um, and, and so that's a population that should seriously be considered for genetic counseling and testing. In medulloblastoma, only about five to 6% of all comers have an underlying predisposition. Um, but in the sonic hedgehog uh, uh, subgroup, um, the, the prevalence of germline variants in BRCA2, PALB2, Patch1, SUFU, and P53 is much higher at 15 to 20%. And APC mutations are uh, enriched in the, in the WIND subtype. So, so far, I've been talking about cancer predispositions quite broadly, um, but what are the specific syndromes that we encounter in practice? Um, most of you are likely quite familiar with many of these, such as Lee Framini syndrome, MEN2, FAP, <clears throat> and, uh, and more recently described syndromes like constitutional mismatch repair syndrome, which may not be as familiar, um, but the available data suggests that this one is, this is one of the most penetrant during childhood. And in a recent survey of seven large cancer predisposition programs, you can see the most common diagnoses encountered um, with variable distribution across the centers, reflecting um, local expertise and, and practice patterns. Importantly, though, the, the number of patients with, with other diagnoses um, to the right here far exceeds these top diagnoses, highlighting the rarity of, of most of the individual syndromes. So with, with over 100 cancer susceptibility genes that, that may contribute to a wide variety of tumors in childhood, and with frequent new associations, it, it, it can be quite challenging to keep up with, even for those of us who think about it all the time. And, and fortunately, some innovative folks have put together a modal, mobile application um, to help all of us in decision-making about referral for genetic counseling. This app is freely available for download. Um, it's quite easy to use and, and, and very educational. Um, and in fact, I strongly encourage all of our fellows to use it regularly and, and have to say that I, I use it myself um, more than occasionally. The app was recently validated to be very sensitive in detecting cancer predispositions, and you should be on the lookout for another validation paper um, from this group very soon. But the recognition of the high prevalence of cancer predispositions in children with cancer is still relatively new, and survivorship clinics care for children and new predispositions uh, may not have been considered at, at the time of diagnosis. This paper from the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study cohort demonstrated a prevalence of cancer predispositions of about 12% from over 5,000 long-term pediatric cancer survivors. The highest frequency of variants was in genes that are typically associated with adult cancer, um, such as BRCA1 and 2, PALB2, PMS2, and, and CDKN2A. Notably, the prevalence in osteosarcoma was only about 6%, which is considerably less um, than, than the large osteosarcoma that I just mentioned. And, and this um, suggests perhaps inferior outcomes in those with osteosarcoma and cancer predisposition, all that, although that remains to be formally demonstrated. Um, thus, those with a focus in survivorship care should be on the lookout for patients that, that may need genetic counseling based on their cancer history. And in fact, here at, at AFLAC, uh, we have a genetic counselor that's embedded in our survivorship clinics about once per week. And, and, and for those of you who routinely care for survivors, um, I'm sure that you're familiar with the COG long-term follow-up guidelines um, that are updated every five years. And, and I'm, I'm pleased to let you know that the update that's expected in October of this year will include um, for the first time, a section for cancer predisposition <clears throat> that will help guide referral for genetic counseling um, when indicated. Um, that's gonna look very similar to this draft, <clears throat> excuse me. Kim Nichols and Lisa Diller led the effort among predisposition experts to put this together, along with Danielle Friedman and Monica Grammatiches on the guidelines team. <clears throat> so be on the lookout for this uh, soon. But why does all this matter? Um, of course, it's more than just knowledge about the origin of disease. Um, for some, for those like those with who have FAP, Effective cancer prevention strategies can be undertaken in adolescence um, or young adulthood, um, which is um, certainly encouraged. 
Another perhaps more controversial prevention strategy is preemptive hematopoietic stem cell transplantation in those with leukemia predispositions. This commentary was an interesting exercise in, in calculating risks of preemptive transplant when the penetrance of leukemia is near 100% versus uh, 50%. So 100% on the left and 50% on the right. In most cases, this calculation is not that simple though, and, and also includes some ethical aspects that, that need to be considered. And, and taking it a little bit further in, into the, the complicated, I've, I've been asked on several occasions about the role of transplant after remission of standard risk BALL in, in children with germline ATV6 mutations. So in, in cases like those, a major question is whether the intent of the transplant is to treat the leukemia, which wouldn't be expected to relapse, or to prevent future variably penetrant hematopoietic manifestations of disease. So th those are not easy questions to answer and require input from transplanters, oncologists, um, genetic counselors, and, and, and I think most importantly, um, the family. Um, but, but for other diagnoses, um, the, the, the diagnosis of a cancer predisposition, um, like those with trisomy 21 or Fanconi anemia and cancer, Therapy may be altered due to the susceptibility of, of severe adverse effects. Um, so for example, with prolonged hospitalization um, to mitigate infection risk in those with Down syndrome or avoidance of ionizing radiation in preparation for transplant um, in those with Fanconi anemia. Uh, the diagnosis may also affect family planning of the parents or the patient. Um, that may also include pre-implantation genetic testing. And it may lead to the identification um, of additional family members with the same diagnosis through cascade testing. And lastly, um, tumor surveillance strategies such as the Toronto Protocol may significantly impact um, long-term survival. Uh, the survival curve in the upper right um, shows the results of a study in which patients with Lee from any syndrome self-selected to aggressive tumor surveillance or not, and, and the patients in the surveillance arm um, did much better um, with the red curve there. Um, similarly, in another study of constitutional mismatch repair disorder, adherence to an aggressive tumor surveillance regimen um, was associated uh, with improved survival. Um, and, and, and there was a dose effect in, in, in surveillance. Those who um, participated in partial surveillance um, didn't do quite as well as those who um, were, were adherent, most adherent to their program. Um, however, um, until, um, however, the, the data for most of the syndromes is, is not nearly as strong as this. And, and until several, several years ago, there were not consensus-based guidelines and surveillance strategies um, for most syndromes. And so that led to a workshop in, in 2016, um, sponsored by the AACR and organized by um, Garrett Berder, David Malkin, Sharon Plon, Josh Schiffman, and Kim Nichols, that brought together 65 pediatric oncologists, geneticists, genetic counselors, and other experts from 11 countries around the world, um, with the goal of developing consensus guidelines for tumor surveillance um, for a wide variety of syndromes. And what came out of this workshop was 17 guidelines uh, for over 50 childhood cancer predisposition syndromes. They were peer reviewed and, and published in Clinical Cancer Research in 2017. Um, they're all freely available online at, at the website that this QR code directs you to. Um, some are for the more common predispositions um, that you're probably very familiar with, um, whereas other are for um, rarer conditions. Um, that you may be less familiar with. Uh, Lisa Diller at Dana-Farber led the development of a web-based application for clinicians to reference based on these guidelines and available at this QR code. Uh, one simply chooses the predisposition um, in, in the drop-down menu and specifies the age of the patient um, and the recommended surveillance studies and, and, and schedule are, are provided. Um, it's, it's quite the useful tool. And, and perhaps beats carrying around the, um, the beat up folder that, that I do um, when I'm in my clinic. Um, but, but for some of these diseases, the, the surveillance protocols are, are quite intensive and, and, and challenging for families to stay on top of. And, and so this led one of our genetic counselors, Bajana Pacheva, and my colleague, Sarah Mitchell, to partner with Wilbur Lamb's team to develop a mobile app 
to help families manage their tumor surveillance. This was published in Pediatric Blood and Cancer just this week. Um, the app allows for a user to create profiles for multiple family members and, and specified their shared syndrome. Um, based on the diagnosis and AACR guidelines, it, it provides a surveillance plan that can be customized and integrated into the calendar function of the device and provides reminders about upcoming appointments. Feedback in the usability testing was positive and, and a larger study of its effectiveness in promoting adherence is, is in the planning stages. But back to the output from the AACR meeting, um, there were also a couple of disease agnostic papers in, in this series. And, and one of these I think is particular not particularly notable. Um, and that was the one from the genetic counselors that attended the meeting. They made the points um, that, that you see here. And I've highlighted a couple that I think are particularly pertinent. Um, one, that patients should have genetic counseling prior to testing, and that the timing of counseling should be decided between the, the treating oncologist and the counselor. Ideally, referral is made as soon as the diagnosis of cancer is made, um, and then the, the counselor and the, and the physician can decide about when that counseling should occur. Um, the second is, is that genetic counseling is an ongoing process, um, and that process is, is to reinforce information um, identify family members who should also have counseling, assess the need for psychological support, and for reinforcement of age-specific risks and management, including in late teens regarding the risk um, to offspring. Of course, the scientific merit versus the psychological and financial burden need to be considering in, in tailoring testing and, and surveillance plans for families. So in addition to the guidelines, um, the organizers of the meetings uh, concluded that these guidelines should serve as a, a consensus-based standard of care for justification of surveillance studies to insurance companies, which seems to have been effective, at least in my practice. I, I rarely um, run into um, flat-out denials of, of tumor surveillance studies. Further, they present the opportunity for uniformity of care across centers and, and, and therefore a foundation to address several areas of research. And lastly, they emphasized the need to form a network of specialty centers in the US and internationally and to develop a large registry and biorepository repository um, agnostic to, to the underlying predisposition. And so this led to the formation of the Cancer Predisposition Working Group within COG. Um, with the support of COG leadership, um, particularly Peter Adamson initially, and then, and then subsequently Doug Hawkins. We have defined the mission to be that, that for children with cancer predispositions um, to promote the implementation of best practice and consensus guidelines and to promote and facilitate research. Um, the leadership includes the uh, organizers of the AACR meeting, um, some young investigators that they mentor, um, and Anita Valani and me, who were nominated to spearhead the effort. Um, this group has worked with the survivorship committee, as I mentioned earlier, and is now working with the molecular pathologists leading COG's molecular characterization initiative to optimize germline reporting from that study. Um, we're also in the planning stages of a project with the epidemiology committee, which I will mention uh, shortly. One limitation of COG though, is, is that there's really not a mechanism by which to study children um, with cancer predispositions who have not had cancer. And so this led to the establishment of the Consortium for Childhood Cancer Predisposition funded by the St. Baldrick's Foundation. We've started with the seven institutions listed here with, the, with visions of expansion in the future. Um, the consortium has collaborated with, with Sam Volkenbaum and the Pediatric Cancer Data Commons team to develop umbrella data and material transfer agreements, allowing for relatively facile project development and data collection and sharing, including with the PCDC, such that data may be collected prior to a cancer diagnosis and linked to COG and or other consortia data if and when cancer does develop. Ideally, this would continue through survivorship, such that data is collected and available for researchers throughout the, the child's uh, cancer journey. So our, our consortium's first study is the Childhood Cancer Predisposition Study. Um, 
This is modeled to some extent on the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study uh, in that it is uh, a registry and biorepository through which sub-studies may be run. Uh, a primary goal of the study is to evaluate the effectiveness of tumor surveillance strategies for the most common diagnoses in the real-world setting. And Surya Rednam at Baylor is spearheading a study, uh, a sub-study to identify barriers to adherence um, to recommended surveillance protocols. This is the study schema showing that we were recruiting and, and following children with predisposition syndromes, as well as their affected family members and unaffected first degree relatives, um, from whom we're also collecting biorepository samples, um, at least um, termline DNA. And, and we've enrolled over 150 subjects to date and expect enrollment to accelerate over the next few months to several hundred per year. So I hope that by now I've made the point that that great progress has been made in the last decade in understanding um, the prevalence of cancer predispositions in children with cancer um, and in developing better strategy for their identification and, and providing clinicians with consensus-based guidelines for tumor surveillance. Moreover, I, I think that we've established an infrastructure through which we can prospectively study children with predispositions without cancer and share those data with the PCDC um, for others to mine. But, but challenges remain, not, not the least of which is the rapid identification of novel cancer and gene associations um, and variant classification um, within genes. There, there seem to be a new association between gene variants and cancer almost weekly. Um, some of these associations are quite strong and reproducibly demonstrated. However, some of them are not sufficiently supported in evidence to change practice and distinguishing between these can be very challenging. Even among the well-established autosomal dominant cancer predisposition variants, the causation of tumor is, is not always demonstrated. And this requires more rigorous study, often of the tumor, looking for loss of heterozygosity or other molecular signatures indicating gene dysfunction. Moreover, as more germlines are being tested, new variants within genes are detected at increasing rates. These new variants <clears throat> require classification as to pathogenicity, which is an arduous task. And fortunately, ClinGen, which is co-led by Sharon Plon at Baylor, is organizing a massive effort to develop rules for classification and curate tens of thousands of variants. The ClinGen website is a wonderful resource for exploring gene variants and disease associations that is easily found uh, via Google search. On the patient side, there are a number of questions that remain about consent to testing and expectation and understanding of results. Multiple studies have demonstrated that families really do desire knowledge about underlying genetic predispositions and generally feel empowered by that knowledge, uh, even if it confers a high cancer risk. And one study from St. Jude's documented families' preferences, though, to delay an approach for consent to germline testing for several weeks allowing time to adjust to a cancer diagnosis. Um, this, I think, is feasible in the clinical setting, but is much more, much more of a challenge in the research setting, especially if germline testing is done in the context of tumor sequencing. More concerning, though, is how informed families may be when providing consent for tumor germline sequencing in the context of a clinical trial. And, and this group from Australia documented that a majority of parents expected that germline testing was at least somewhat likely to reveal a relevant finding. And almost one third inaccurately recalled uh, receiving a clinically relevant germline finding. Uh, unfortunately, there was general confusion and uncertainty after the return of results uh, among the parents. And so I, th I think that this should serve as a good reminder that in most contexts, the way that we obtain informed consent for research including um, of, of germline DNA is, is not a substitute for effective genetic counseling. And as mentioned, um, counseling is a process, not a one-time consultation. And so studies that include germline testing need to be very thoughtful about how to obtain truly informed consent and support families in understanding the results. Um, disparities in outcomes for children with cancer are, are well-documented. 
and, and I was recently asked to give a talk on disparities in childhood cancer predisposition, which ended up being quite the challenge as the available data on the topic are exclusively um, from adults. Um, and, and so testing for hereditary breast and ovarian cancer became available over 20 years ago. And, and differences in, in the uptake of genetic services was documented almost right away. Um, in, in 2005, this group demonstrated that African-American women with a family history of breast cancer, breast or ovarian cancer were less likely to undergo genetic counseling for BAC1 and 2 testing um, than, than white women. And disparity, this disparity persists uh, as documented in this study um, from just a few years ago, showing um, really striking differences in the rates of referral for genetic counseling for breast cancer among African-Americans, Hispanic, and whites, with only 37% of African-Americans referred compared to 86% of whites. And notably, there were differences among English versus Spanish-speaking Hispanics, um, suggesting that language barriers influence referral rates too. Um, and, and these referral patterns were reflected in, in genetic testing rates with Blacks having by far the lowest rates of genetic testing. So these disparities clearly exist in the context of adult cancer predispositions. And, and for me, there's, there's little reason to believe that, that similar disparities don't exist for children with cancer predispositions, particularly those who have not had cancer. But I, I am hopeful that with future work, we can address these challenges and, and an answer additional research questions. Um, one study that's in the concept phase is a prospective cohort of children with um, cancer and um, cancer predisposition who are identified through COG's MCI um, with, with goals that include um, assessment of healthcare utilization and patient reported outcomes um, with attention to factors that are associated with health disparities. Uh, this effort's being run through the Epidemiology Committee of COG and, um, and led by Philip Lupo. Um, another big development um, that is upcoming is, is updates to the AACR uh, surveillance guidelines. Um, the second um, workshop is, is going to happen just in a, in a few weeks, um, and Garrett Berdur and David Malkin are again um, chairing that effort. And the organizers are frantically making plans um, for the meeting later this month and, and to approve upon the guidelines um, with any new clinical information that, that has become available in the last um, six or seven years. And, and we're continuing to work on strategies for expanding our consortium um, with the primary barrier being financial. Um, we would we would love to include um, several more centers, um, but but um, need a budget to do so. Um, and, and but but in the meantime, we are continuing to collect samples to test novel surveillance strategies, um, such as with circulating um, cell free DNA. And, and we're particularly interested in exploring cancer prevention strategies and, and encourage anyone with great ideas to contact us about how the consortium might be able to facilitate your study. And I'm going to finish with a study that, that demonstrates the potential complexity of the future of, of childhood cancer predisposition. And this was published just um, in the last couple of months. Um, it was led by uh, David Malkin. Um, and the intent was to identify genetic and, and epigenetic modifiers of cancer risk in Lee Fraumini syndrome. And, and they found that, that among um, variant P53 carriers, nearly 40% who developed cancer harbored an additional pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant in another cancer-related gene. Um, notably, and I think very interestingly, modifier variants in the WIT signaling pathway were associated with decreased cancer incidence um, and improved survival. Um, furthermore, um, inherited epi mutations in cancer-associated genes, including ASXL1, ETB6, and LEF1, are associated with an increased cancer risk. And, and so together, a, a, a genomics-informed risk stratification can be applied for those with Lee Farmini syndrome. Um, and, and one can imagine uh, similar modifiers of cancer risk and other syndromes, 
but but I think these are going to be extremely challenging to tease out, even with enrollment of, of large numbers of subjects, both with and without cancer. So I, I'm going to end a little early um, and, and acknowledge the, the many folks um, that have been pioneers in, in the field for many years and, and serve as mentors and collaborators for those of us that have jumped on the bandwagon more recently. Um, these include Sharon, David, Josh, Garrett, Lisa, and Kim, who I'll, I've mentioned already. Um, Anita Villani is co-chair of the um, COG Working Group, as well as uh, the consortium. Um, we have great support and collaboration within COG, um, including Doug Hawkins, and, and we've benefited greatly from the organization of the Pediatric Cancer Data Commons, um, to which we hope to be contributing early next year. Um, and of course, St. Baldrick's has been an amazing supporter of our consortium, um, and the AACR has, has supported the development of the um, of the surveillance guidelines, um, including this, this next meeting. Um, and of course, I couldn't contribute to any of this large scale work if it weren't for the outstanding genetic counselors that, that run our program here at AFLAG. Um, so I'll, I'll, again, put up the resources that I mentioned here and, and we'll be happy to take any questions um, that, that you all may have. Thank you very much. Um... That was that was great. The the first question I had was about the apps you named, and it seems like you just put those back up. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to try and get the uh, the QR codes while you answer. Um, the first question we have that came in, um, and the only one so far. So if you have other questions, um, by all means submit them. Um, is what is what is known about the germline variants of POP1 gene and the risk of brain cancer? Yeah, so um, this is what I usually phone my genetic counseling friends. The, so, so th th there is an association of pot one and and cancers, and and I think of this as one that is more associated with um, with adult tumors than than childhood tumors. Although, although it has been reported in in, in children with cancers, also, I, I, I know that we have had one case where we got a, a variant of unknown significance in, in pot one and we wound up um, doing um, uh, telomere length studies to, to see if, if it was um, pathogenic or, or likely pathogenic and it was not. And so we didn't, we didn't do any follow-up on that. I think one of the important things about um, such disease associations is um, is how does it affect your your clinical management and and is is that information um, are, are you going to do anything different with the patient if if um, if you find such a a variant um, even if it's if it's pathogenic and and um, and in some cases the answer may in fact be yes uh, and um, in some cases it, it may be that it's it's not with the patient that's in front of you but it is with the um, the patient's mother or father who who shares the same variant. So, um, so some of the, some of these um, loose associations with disease can be um, challenging to decide what to do with. Thank you. Um, I wanted to say two things before I get to the next question. One, Vidya, it it's possible that we could use um, these surveillance tools in the YI booklet. We put on a conference for 100 young investigators every year. And I think this would be useful for them to yeah. have as a tool. And yeah. then the family one, family one we could put into our um, our childhood cancer guides, which are books for families. And then I also wanted to let everyone know that um, we have a program called the Crazy Eight, which is large projects, uh, four to $5 million projects. And we have, I guess, six of them so far. And the next one that we're going to put an RFP out is for predispositions. So there'll be an opportunity for a $5 million predisposition project coming in the, maybe maybe the RFP will go out within, within the next six months, six to eight months, I think. We've been raising money all this year for it, and we have it just about funded. Um, next question is, have you looked at viral integration sites in their potential role in childhood cancers? Uh, the, the short answer is no. Um, I, and that, that's that's an area of, of literature um, 
where my knowledge um, is extremely lacking. So I, I can't I can't speak to that intelligently. <laughs> okay. Next one, how, how would you educate pediatricians who may be the first contact for a parent patient about predisposition and the process of diagnosis and surveillance? Yeah, that, that's a really great question and one that we've, we've talked about a little bit as, uh, as a group in, in trying to get some of this information out to the general pediatrics community. Um, General pediatricians are a a, um, a good referral source for us, um, but but I think it's not all of the the general pediatricians. It's the one who know that that we exist, and and um, so so I think that that we as a community of of cancer predisposition um, uh, providers need to do a better job of getting to um, you know some of the general pediatrics meetings and publishing papers in those general pediatrics um, journals to raise awareness of you know the the, the prevalence in, in cancer um, the resources the, the guidelines that that are available um, for those with predispositions um, you know a you know a challenging uh, referral that that oftentimes comes from the the general pediatrician is is the the child of the mother who has recently been diagnosed with or, or recently found to, to be a carrier of a BRCA one or two mutant mutation or variant. Um, and, and they, they want their child to be tested. Sometimes the general pediatrician will just, um, will just do it. Um, other times they recognize that that may not be in the best interest of the child because it takes the autonomy away from the child in terms of, um, knowing whether or not they carry the same variant. And, and so um, those are cases where, where, you know, we're really happy to be able to provide the genetic counseling to the, um, to the family. And, um, and in, in many cases, we try to dissuade them from um, pursuing that testing, but if, if they're adamant, then, then we will, we will do so um, because we think that it'll be better if, if we are able to help them process the information than if they do it through 23andMe or, or, or some other um, provider. Um, yeah, so sorry, that I went off on a tangent there, but, um, but, but we need to do better about educating our general pediatricians. Well, I think I know the answer to this one from talking to Garrett a lot, but um, <laughs> is there a protocol or that is standardized for genetic testing and surveillance for all predisposition syndromes? Um, no. Um, so, so I think one, one, one thing that is challenging is, is that while we have guidelines for surveillance after the diagnosis, um, I, I don't think that we have a standardized, um, set of, of guidelines that that's at least, um, uh, generally agreed upon for, for whom to test. Um, I mentioned several, um, diagnoses and and other factors that that should um should prompt referral for uh, genetic counseling but I, I don't think that there is um is is a standard um a guideline for for whom to test um that, that, that that's all comers um now the 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 mypog application um i think is very very good it, it is a very useful tool um and and like I say, we we do rely on it to some extent at, at our center. Okay, last question I have is, how do you get new variants from the studies into a testing protocol that is used for screening? Well, so so I think that that is a challenge and that that one has to so so these 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 tumor gene associations get reported um but but what is is less known is what is the prevalence of tumors in individuals who have those you know variants in those particular genes in many cases and so so if it, it may be true that you know lots of people with pot 1 variants have have, excuse me, that, that, that lots of tumors are, are found in people who have pot one variants. 
Um, but but the opposite is not necessarily true that, that people with BOT1 variants have lots of tumors. And so whether one should do surveillance on someone with a BOT1 variant is, is, is not clear if you don't know the prevalence of tumors in the population that, mm -hmm. that carries the variant. And so those, those population-based studies are, are um, to some extent necessary to determine what is the true cancer risk in individuals who have the variants. And that, that's why I think it's critically important to collect information about all comers with a, a, a genetic variant rather than just those who have the cancer. Okay, we have one more that just came in just under the wire. Um, what are the current ongoing initiatives and clinical trials in, in the making available for primary prevention strategies in childhood cancer predispositions? And how do we best promote the development of those? Well, that, that's a good question. It's one of the reasons why I, I am, am asking for, for good ideas from, from the community. You know, there, there have been, and, and I think this falls under secondary prevention, um, there have been medication um, uh, trials um, for FAP um, and, and for, um, for leaf Romania syndrome. I think that there is one ongoing. To, uh, the number of children that are included in those trials, though, I'm not certain of. And I think that there are, um, there are agents um, that are under study for um, VHL as well. Um, but, but I think it, it's going to, it's going to take a champion um, in a particular disease um, uh, type that that um, wants to to put together that type of study, um, and, and then enrollment of you know lots and lots of people at lots and lots of different places um, uh, in order to answer the question of how effective it is. And and you know the so, some of some of these um, disorders are are common enough to where I think that. That inclusion of, of, you know, seven centers might be sufficient, but uh, you know, for rarer diseases, um, we really are going to need to be able to expand enrollment in a in a larger consortium. Um, so I, I, you know, th this is one of the things that that I think um, can be powerful about a, a large consortium is that we can answer um, some of these challenging questions as for rare diseases. So we need more money, more research. Uh, yes, <laughs> and and we we need disease champions that that are, are willing to put in the hard work because it, it is going to be a challenge, one to get the money, but but then to um, to develop the, the the trial and and figure out how to answer the question that that's being addressed. So we've often thought, and this is just me uh, at the end. There's no more questions, but we've often thought that. If we can figure out how to prevent some of these predisposition syndromes from turning into cancer, we might be able to figure out the key to to other cancers. Do you think that that is the case? I, I, I do think that there is a lot to be learned um, from the cancer predisposition population about how cancers develop and potentially how um, they could be prevented and or treated. Um, and and you know the Dr. Malkin's work in in um, in the, the modifiers of, of, of cancer risk, I think is very intriguing. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, practically what we do with that information yet, but, but, but I think, you know, it, it tells us that there's a lot more to be learned about, about what it is that is um, transforming tissue in, into tumors. And it, it's not just the TPP3 mutation, it's TPP3 mutation plus something else. Um, otherwise, all patients with Lee-Fermini syndrome would have tumors as, as, as children, and, and they just don't. Um, so, um, so, so I do think that, that biologically, this population um, could tell us a lot, and, 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 it, and it doesn't necessarily have to be um, mutation-related. It, it, it could be that, that individuals who have a, a different state of inflammation at different stages in their life may be more um, likely to get a, a tumor. Um, but but those are questions that I don't think have been um, uh, addressed very well yet.